making some time for me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, uh, I am, uh, of course, uh, approaching this situation with complete ignorance, and I, I have no idea what you're going to ask me. But we're entrepreneurs, so yeah. we do, right? So yeah. I'm, 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 I'm grateful to have my coach in my Free Zone Frontier program, uh, Dan Sullivan. Dan, I've known you for many years, worked with you for many years. And I got to be honest with you, it's one of the best things I've ever done, uh, being part of the Free Zone Frontier. I really, really appreciate all the work that we do in, in, in this very high level group. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I am in the process of taking one of the tools. So there's so many things that I've incorporated over the years. Most recently, um, I hired a book writer, a scribe, um, who is helping me write a book. Mm -hmm. And um, that's through a relationship that you introduced me mm -hmm. to. Is that right? Could you share? Because that's a perfect, <laughs> explanation of what we're talking about today which is collaboration mm -hmm. uh are you speaking about uh, uh ben or gore or uh tucker tucker max yeah tucker like tucker i had known tucker through joe polish um going back um six or seven years uh, he was uh, in the genius network presentation you know the annual conference and tucker uh, it, Tucker was, um, you know, I could tell he was very, very talented, but it, uh, you know, I was sitting in the audience and he was on stage and uh, uh, I was very, very interested in his thinking about books. And uh, one of the things that I look for, um, Steve, uh, is any kind of capability from the outside that can assist my entrepreneurial clients. So I, I kind of stockpile uh, uh, capabilities. And another one that we have in common is Peter Diamandis. And uh, I met, uh, again, I met uh, Peter through Joe Polish. And, uh, uh, and um, you know, and I had collaborated with him to create um, uh, the technological, he's sort of a, he, he's what I would call a real, technological explorer he's a pathfinder he's a map maker in the uh in the technological world and i said you know a lot of my clients are really interested in technology and i read books and they ask me questions but it's certainly not an area of expertise and if there was a venue that uh, some of our strategic coach clients could uh, attend on a regular basis and build up their understanding of how technology is changing the world, changing their marketplace, uh, you know, changing being an entrepreneur, it would be good. So we've collaborated for 10 years right now. And the deal is it's his, uh, he owns it and it's his money, but we get the capabilities. So my uh, big attitude um, towards collaboration, Steve, is um, and how I approach it, because I think that there's many, many different approaches to collaboration, but I, uh, mine is that I'm not looking for money in the, uh, in the collaboration. I'm looking for extended capability, uh, that I can, um, provide to my clients and they, they can pay the other person they can do it, but I just want to have uh, more and more dimensions to strategic coach that if you come in, uh, then uh, we're going to introduce you to this possibility. We're going to introduce you to this possibility. It's like EOS. We have a collaboration with EOS. We have a, uh, really, we have a collaboration with Colby. We, you know, the Colby company. And um, I never look for money because uh, I want to keep putting the pressure on strategic coach itself to make itself more, uh, you know, more valuable and, uh, you know, that our money comes through one source. So it's, it may be a peculiarity of me, it may be an idiosyncratic uh, uh, thing, but it's kind of like I've taken a one, I'm, I'm kind of like a one master dog and I've got this one company and I just want to keep expanding the capabilities of this company but not to have inside what uh, exists in a better form outside, but just we, we're kind of a connector to outside capabilities. So that's, that's my, if I had to sum it up uh, very, very quickly, that would be my approach to collaboration. 
So it's interesting. Um, so this book is all about funding through storytelling. And you tell a story about a relationship that you have and or conceptualized and you came from the US to the Canadian border and they say, do you have anything to declare? declare? <laughs> do you know which story I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Would you share that? Would you mind telling that story again? Because I'm sure I won't get it exactly right. Well, first of all, um, uh, Babs and I, my lifetime partner, who is my partner and strategic coach, uh, we're both American born and we're still American citizens. And uh, the tax department in the United States knows that we're citizens. And, um, and but each, uh, each of us during the 1970s uh, decided that Toronto was a great place to live in. And so uh, over the years, we've become Canadian citizens, which has some, um, you know, having dual citizenship has some very definitely pluses and it has some minuses. And uh, our feeling is the pluses are greater than the minuses. But uh, the thing is that we operate a business um, uh, in Canada and in the United States, and we're also in the UK, but that's a separate situation. And um, um, so uh, I'm always interested in the going back and forth across borders. And um, um, it's been automated now, so you have eye scan and you have finger fingerprint thing. But um, periodically, uh, you know, they say go and talk to one of the border guards, and uh, he'll say, "What are you bringing into the country?" And we said, "Just um, personal belongings." Do do you have do you have any uh, alcohol? No, we don't have any alcohol. Do you have any tobacco? No, we don't have any tobacco. All right. But what that person doesn't realize is that we've got ideas that are uh, very valuable and uh, we're not scanned for ideas. And I said, I hope it's a long time in the future before <laughs> we are. And uh, and uh, it's um, <clears throat> but um, th that's the um, the the essence, I think, more and more, Steve, and you're finding this out in your own. Uh, world, oftentimes the best collaborations are where one person's ideas are combined with another person's ideas and a third thing is created and neither could have created that third thing on their own, but together they can put capabilities together to create a third thing in in the world. And that's really what I'm looking, looking for um, <clears throat> uh, in case of Peter Diamandis, uh, we've created A360, but we also created a, uh, a really very popular podcast series, and we go back and forth, and uh, Peter's in my program, and I'm in A360. And it's just where you sense that there, um, another person is kind of parallel to you going in the same direction and has the same instincts of what kind of value they want to create in the in the future. And, uh, and you know, I just, uh, we were... We uh, this morning U.S. time or Canadian time, we had a, uh, a sales event in the U.K. These were all U.K. people. It was on Zoom, uh, but um, we did it, and we've met a very interesting person who's coming in, and he's an A360 member, and he's got a very, very interesting and uh, sort of layman's version of artificial intelligence called Rainbow. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and he, um, uh, you know, he, uh, I just hit it, uh, hit it off with him. We met in January at, uh, Abundance 360 and he was in a breakout group with Babs and we did it by just uh, somebody you just really meet. And now we're talking about possibly, uh, bringing he's, he's joining the program and then we're going to, uh, see his methodology where it would be useful. And I think it would be really useful at the free zone level level where at just business owners can create their own uh, AI programs. So they can create their own AI programs. It's very, very simple. I mean, Ooh. you know, it's a very simple thing. So that's the sort of collaboration. And if we created it, I would just introduce him to people. And, you know, um, you know we, we would have probably our own use for it. But uh, so he's joining the program and that'll give him an inside view of strategic coach. And I said, I think uh, entrepreneurs who collaborate are really the people that you want to learn how to use this. Uh, you know, each collaboration, I think, has its own unique um, 
knowledge and um, it'd be interesting if a group of um, free zone collaborators could um, kind of figure out, you know, knowing what they know, you know, we often know what we we know uh, what we're going to do, but we don't know how we know it exactly. And what Especially his AI. and what his thing does is that you know pretty well how you know what you know, which I think is a great. Uh, well, that's that's instant attraction for me because I've been going down, down this AI route yeah. for a very long time. So the book is focused on funding, and yeah. most people get stuck on funding, but the opportunities that arise as a result of collaboration are sometimes so much larger, often so much larger and less complicated. I'll share with you. So, so Peter Diamandis relationship, that's actually what brought me back to you. I was in your program for years and then felt that I, I went, moved on to entrepreneurs organization, which is not coaching at all. And then I met Peter through Tony Robbins. I was a platinum partner. And then I saw that Peter was part of your circles. You were doing something very attractive to me at the time. It was the 10X. And I said, you know what? I'm going back to strategic coach. And I did, and I really enjoyed it. And then I, I joined what is now known as Free Zone Frontier. And, and during that process, I met Mike Koenigs, who's great, you know, EOS, you know, I, I, I'm actually doing some work with them now. Nick Nanton, Joe Polish, all good people. And I personally have this passion for doing impactful things in the world. And Nick was kind enough to introduce me to the uh, founder of a bank called Climate First Bank. And at that very moment, I was in the process of purchasing a 360 acre farm to plant these crazy trees that I'm planting mm -hmm. that draw down tons of carbon and really good stuff. Things that I've spoken to my Koenigs about. He's like, oh my gosh, this is a miracle. And we are the first deal that Climate First Bank is doing. They're opening June 1 and somewhere between June 1 and June 4th, my, my property is getting funded. And I would have gone out and looked to investors to raise the capital but now I'm able to have a traditional style bank who's focused on climate change because I'm doing, you know, I'm planting in that range, in that area of climate change. Mm -hmm. And, and it was amazing. So I've, I've had so much value, but the idea of collaboration, I think most people miss that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, if I can, without a great deal of knowledge, uh, how this particular collaboration have, I think that what really creates uh, great collaborations is that you uh, you want to create value for the same end user, that there's a particular end user uh, in mind or a particular type of value creation, you know, is, um, you know, uh, making the environment more carbon friendly. You've got a philosophy of doing that. Somebody else has a philosophy. Well, right off the bat, you have one of the ingredients for a collaboration, and that is that where your heart is, long range is in the same place, and then your mind is in the same place. I think the heart comes first. You know, we we love certain things or we dislike certain things, and I think that we we have stronger relationships based on love or not love. Uh, than we do on um, intellectual intellectual grounds, and then we use our intellect to uh, to construct the collaboration and to uh, you know put measurements to uh, the value that's actually going to be created. And the uh, second thing is moving back from that you have the same endpoint, you have the same end user, is that together you can create something that neither of you could have done on your own. Yeah. You know? So I think those are the two fundamental things. And that's before you talk about money, that's before you talk about anything. And then the other, uh, the other thing, Steve, is my preference is the combining of capabilities uh, that create a exponential. In, in other words, this capability, this capability, it's not plus, it's times. Uh, so you actually multiply capabilities. And the reason I like that is I like uh, almost anything that the IRS can't measure. Hmm. Exactly. You're, you're creating a multiple and an exponential in results, but it doesn't show up in any normal way of financial 
um, you know, I mean, there's records and the thing, but um, if you create a, te- if you go 10 times, um, you, your capability goes 10 times, um, that's not measurable anywhere until you actually produce a financial result or uh, change in there. And I think that um, um, we're with, uh, I think actually that it's been greatly assisted over the last year by uh, the pandemic, the COVID, the pandemic lockdowns, which required us all to become skillful with virtual conferencing that my feeling is that there's a whole brand new economy that has actually been created, mostly entrepreneurial. And I think uh, uh, mostly collaborative over the last year that doesn't register on any of the normal uh, metrics of how the economy is doing. I think it's actually mysterious. Uh, I think it's a bit mysterious that um, Main Street has had a rough time, but Wall Street is doing really well. Yeah, And my interpretation of that is that uh, Wall Street is basically insiders, you know, that basically, I don't mean insiders in an illegal way, but there are people who are intensely interested in certain economic activities and they have a great deal of knowledge and they know where the new connections are being made. And they, I mean, all investment for in, into stocks is a bet on the future. You know, you're betting now on a much bigger future. And I think that there's just a massively big future that's being created that doesn't show up in the normal economic statistics. And the and so to quote- And I think a lot of it is collaborative. It's actually putting things together. Uh, I, there's money involved, but there's mostly talent involved. There's intelligence involved. And I, I think we, uh, for some reason, we'll look back 50 years from now and we'll say it was that year, 2020 to 2021, when the collaborative crossover took place. Well, to quote Peter Diamandis, our friend, um, you know, the future is faster than you think. Mm-hmm. And how many years did we go in technology and adoption of technology, telemedicine, Zoom calls instead of jumping on uh, on airplanes inside of a one year period? I think it's 50 years. I think it was the early 70s till last year. It was around 1970 to 2020. I think it was a 50 year, 50 year crossover. We had a jump, though, in people in the adoption, the fact that people are, I mean, in my own organization, when we manage billions of dollars, now people are taking pictures of checks and depositing in accounts instead of coming by the office, FedExing them and so on, which was monumental for us, electronic Mm -hmm. signature, all of that. I had it all set up, but nobody would adopt it because they were used to the traditional way. And now suddenly it's all coming together very quickly. And the uh, not only the adoption of technology, but the exponential capabilities of us from a technological perspective allow us to have explosive growth yeah. through collaborations. And, yeah. and I'm just looking at people who fail to see this. We've talked about investment bankers, venture capitalists, Reg A, Reg D, you know, just doing things on, uh, uh, you know, from, from a collaboration of, of friends and family. But this one, I think most people miss. I don't think. Well, I think the the big it. thing is the um, you know the 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 mania about short term money. You know, where's the money? How fast does the money come? And I said, well, uh, one way of not being in that conversation is to kind of have money handled. In other words, uh, you know, I don't need any bigger lifestyle for the rest of my life than I have right now. Uh, we've got you know net worth that you know. Uh, it's uh, it's just not an issue anymore. So I said, actually, all the work I've done up until now has kind of freed me up from it being about money. You know, I'm not saying I'm going to get into things that lose money, but I said the other thing is I'm much more interested in stockpiling capability. Okay, and the capability isn't even necessarily for us; it's for our strategic coach clients. You know, mm. you know. So yeah, I mean, a three hundred and sixty we created um, ba- uh, Peter and uh, Joe, and um, and Babs and me. We created it because we were continually being asked. You know, inside strategic coach, we should have special workshops on technology. Well, I wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, I I mean, I'm a uh, I'm probably a, a, a knowledgeable civilian, 
uh, you know, in terms of technology. I mean, I read lots of books. I keep up with, uh, but um, I said, um, it makes no sense to have this inside strategic coach, but it makes total sense to create something outside coach that coach clients can do and coach clients can write the check for it. You know, they, they, um, but we don't need the checks. And so, you know, that was the deal with Peter and, you know, and um, anyway, and that, you know, the book we just wrote, uh, you know, the book writing with uh, Ben, Ben Hardy and Tucker Max and the Hay House, all the money stays on that side, but I've got this massive capability. We have a 10 year, 10 book contract now with Hay House and all, um, you know, I don't do any of the writing. I don't do any of the packaging. I don't do any of the negotiating and it's all, it's all taken care of. So I've, I've gained in a massive collaboration and now, um, you know, we do a special workshop for strategic coach clients, uh, for scribe, you know, and, uh, Tucker said, it's been amazing. The number of coach clients who have, you know, signed up with uh, scribe. Well, that's a, that's a capability for for a strategic coach. And, and, and for me, it's an endorsement. You wouldn't connect and collaborate with a company that you didn't endorse. Mm -hmm. And that's huge for us. Well, and the people have to be in coach. I don't do it if they're not in coach, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like they, they understand, you know, they're part of our community too. Peter, uh, Peter was in coach before a 360, a three, Gino Wickman was in coach before, you know, we, we uh, collaborated with EOS. So, um, you know, that, that's sort of a commitment that I really want up front that uh, they're interested because I want to help them with their entrepreneurial future. You know, I want them. Well, it's great the way you've put together your company too. And I find it just, Um, I'm always studying it and I say, okay, I want to do that in my company. I want to do this in my company, but the collaboration aspect has been monumental for me. And in the Tucker Max situation, Scribe Media, I think is this company's name. Mm -hmm. I think I broke the mold of what they were doing, which isn't unusual for entrepreneurs, but in this particular circumstance, since they only deal with entrepreneurs, it was a little surprising. And conversations like this is how I started it. And then I use a technology you introduced me to, which called Otter AI, where yeah. it takes, creates a transcript. And I told my scribe, I said, I don't want to spend two hours on the phone with you. I want you to listen to the podcast. I got it all in Otter AI. Mm-hmm. And then talk to me for an hour, half an hour. And then we talk about what that chapters are about and we're done. And guess what? That works. So yeah. I'm really happy. Can I, can I ask you a question, Steve? Because, um, you know, I find with every entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, you start your career more, more or less as a lone wolf. You know, most entrepreneurs are lone wolves when they start, you know, and that's because, um, you know, um, uh, you're making a fundamental decision to kind of face the marketplace straight on. Most people want a lot of buffers between, the, you know, they want employers and, you know, they want all sorts of security, but entrepreneurs, for whatever reason, uh, just decide to hit the marketplace head on that they can bet on themselves. And uh, what they want is greater freedom, really, uh, you know, freedom of time, money, relationship and purpose. But was there a period uh, and we haven't talked about this, so this is new territory. Was there a period where you had kind of exhausted what you originally thought was being an entrepreneur? And what I mean exhausted was uh, there was always more money to be made. There was always more, uh, you know, more activity that you could do, but uh, it wasn't visionary enough for you, what you were doing. It wasn't um, uh, maybe emotionally, it wasn't as emotionally motivating because I often find the jump from what I would say, uh, commodity-based uh, entrepreneurism, you know, where more or less you're in a competitive situation with entrepreneurs, financial services, real estate, whatever it is. And there's kind of a jump where you have to make a jump to another level. And you say, you know, um, I could do this, but uh, I don't know if it'll keep me interested mm. for another 10, 10 years, 20 years, you know. 
<clears throat> so, and I find that that's a real trouble spot for entrepreneurs because a lot of them make some bad decisions right about that place. You know, they, um, um, they, you know, they, they get involved in, uh, you know, um, you know, all sorts of activities and relationships yeah. that aren't necessarily good for them. So, so yeah, we get involved with what I call mental masturbation. You just go and do other stuff because you're bored to death with your existing business. You could have no impact on it. And for me, it was, I was at a board meeting for EO, the entrepreneurs organization in New York city. I was, I was the president of that chapter at that time. It was the world's largest chapter. And I had a board member, Chintin Panchel and Chintin asked me, what do you do and how do you do it? And so on and so forth. And he was an attorney and he still is, but he's an impact attorney. He's an attorney that represents billionaires that are not looking only to have a return on their money, but they're also looking to have some sort of social or environmental impact. And he said, you know, so he, he started interviewing me. He said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I own a financial services company. We've got a certain number of advisors and so on. He goes, no, what do you do? I said, what do you mean? He goes, no, what do you do in the world? Like, what do you, what's, what's your message? What are you doing? And I said, well, mm -hmm. If you Google Tesla's number one fan, I'm the first hit. That's one of my things because I'm a big Tesla and car aficionado. He's that's cool. And I said, if you look, I said, my buildings lead platinum. I've got 295 solar panels that provide over 95% of my electric. And I said, and we founded an organization called Heroes Against Heroin because some of the people that we known have died, their children have died of heroin overdoses. And he turns to me and he goes, you know, there's a whole world out there called impact investing and I'm an impact attorney. And he says, and this is the way you could impact the world. And I was like, mm. wow. And that was about a decade ago. And since then, I've become the leader in the broker dealer space. I am the weirdo that impact that that embraces entrepreneurs who are looking to make a difference mm. with their businesses, so much so that we've created our blue ocean in this space. Mm -hmm. And we align with it. And we just did a capital raise for a company called World Tree, which is why I'm buying these, this, this company, this uh, farm to grow all these trees. So I tied into my passions, purpose, and money. And now this whole, the whole concept of the book, which mm -hmm. is called The War and Art of Funding, an insider's guide to raising capital through storytelling, is kind of an offshoot from capital raises. And then also I do, um, I've done documentary films as part of my role with the UN, you know, being able to bring mm -hmm. entrepreneurships to the United Nations. So I had a complete transformation in the past decade, which led me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See that, uh, I think the, uh, uh, well, uh, we talk about the first uh, three freedoms, freedom of time, freedom of money, freedom of relationship. And that can be totally understood within the framework of an entrepreneurial operation. But there's uh, the, the fourth one in our in our language is purpose, and that um, you've done all this, you've um, you know you've taken the risks that are involved with entrepreneurship, and uh, you know you've weathered the storm, you've gone through the cycles, you uh, and you've become. Uh, uh, reliably successful, I should say, you know, you've become predictably successful. And that's good. And now you can look at the total package uh, that you put together. And okay, so uh, rather, you know, in other words, you can be the, uh, the mover of important changes in the world, you can bring about important changes. And, uh, and, you know, everybody's got their own idea about that. Everybody's got their own um, things that really appeal to me. My whole thing is entrepreneurship. You know, I'm, um, um, I'm just passionate that, um, that, uh, that um, the world kind of understands that this is very recent in history entrepreneurship as a class of people is oh yeah doesn't go back much beyond 1800 and and the reason is because you didn't have any multiplier technologies mm. that, that entrepreneurs could really leverage and steam power was the first and then you know internal combustion and you know it's all about the um better organization of um 
you know, energy in society, really. And entrepreneurs are people who uniquely uh, organize how energy has an impact, uh, you know, in all, all fields of all areas of activity, you know, I mean, every different kind of profession, every different thing, but there's a there's a phenomenal impact. And it, it's really uh, each individual entrepreneur, I think, sees themselves as responsible for a lifetime, I'll use your word, uh, it's a lifetime impact that we have a mm -hmm. real lifetime impact. And my passion is entrepreneurship as, you know, as, um, uh, you know, as a force in the world. Uh, Without a doubt, there's, there's just so much that we can do from a creative perspective, from a good perspective. And that's what I'm looking to do, to inspire people yeah. to be impactful in the world. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, and, um, um, you know, I'm, um, I've lived uh, on June 5th, I will have lived outside of the United States for 50 years. So mm. um, uh, June 5th is when I moved to Canada. And, uh, and I'm more American today than I was the day I came over the mm. border uh, 50 years ago. I think the States is just a kind of a unique, you know, a unique creation, you know, I mean, there's, um, um, there's just something about the founding and you know how the country was developed and how it's and uh, you know people all have their complaints that this is the worst government we've ever had this is the worst and i said yeah yeah they were saying this in 1795 you know and, mm -hmm. you know and we're coming to an end now and i said yeah they were saying that in 1820 you yeah. know and uh, you know a bunch of worry words you know and, exactly uh, yeah but uh my my feeling is that um and part of the reason is that the U.S. just has a lot of things handled that other countries uh, still have in their future. You know, I mean, it's um, um, it's um, it, it may have its warts and it may have its problems, but generally speaking, um, Americans are yeah, they pretty well have a lot of things handled. And people have a voice. It's interesting. I used to fall asleep when I went to the Hall of Presidents with my father. When I was a kid at Disney, and now it's one of my favorite places to go. It's a bit more animated. They don't look as as robotic as they used to, but you see what's going on, and you get to hear the voices and reminisce about it. So yeah, it's it is. A I mean, our clients come from all over the world now, especially uh, during the last year. We just, you know, the number of countries that clients are coming from because they can do it virtually right now, and. Uh, uh, I, I will tell you the story that you tell about yourself, Steve. Uh, if 10 entrepreneurs tell this story, nine of them are Americans. Ah, we've had our breakthroughs. Well, that's good. And that's very interesting um, because when I took on the role as the um, ambassador for entrepreneurship with the UN, um, it was your toughest audience is going to be the US. So. Dan, it's been wonderful talking to you today. Yeah, was this useful? It was super useful. What, I really what did, appreciate uh, it. What, what, have, what have you gained as a result of our talk? It was just being able to share from the master, you, what a collaboration really mm -hmm. is and the value of it. Yeah. The one thing I would say is, uh, you know, the, the fundraising for it. I think fund, fundraising is a byproduct of putting together new capabilities that I sense when you put new capabilities together to create a new form of value creation, it attracts a lot of money. Mm. There you go. Well, I am in the business of raising capital for entrepreneurs, impactful yeah. entrepreneurs, and I feel like it's aligned with my purpose and I just can't wait to show you what I can do in this world so you can yep. see it all happen before mm -hmm. your eyes. So thank you so much for your time today, Dan. You should really take pictures uh, and present at uh, at the free zone what you're doing with your uh, your property. Thank you. I'm going to be doing a documentary on it too. My next oh with Nick with Nick going to be on it. We're going to be working together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nick's Nick's uh, super. He's amazing. Yeah. So thank you, immigrant sir. immigrant too. You know, didn't know that. Yeah, Barbados, born in Barbados. Huh. And he had he and his father had to leave because uh, if you were white in Barbados, you couldn't make it as a white person. Wow. 
never, to- he never <laughs> told me shows, that story. Kind of shows you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, thank you. I know you have a tight schedule just as I do, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Be well. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.